Hey, welcome everybody for another Entrepreneur Encounters episode six. I am really excited today. I'm Brent F. Wasson. I'm an entrepreneur coach. My goal is to help empower entrepreneurs to find the money, mindset, and means to be able to unleash your business. So today in our efforts to help you level up, I'm having an interview with Taime Nanez. She is the entrepreneur behind Chucho's Red Tacos and also the Farmhouse Paint and Sip along with her husband, Jesus. She's a wonderful entrepreneur and you're going to learn a lot from her story today. So do stay tuned and join in and thanks for coming today. Taime, how are we doing today? I'm good. How are you, Brent? I'm awesome. All right. Uh, Taime, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, just tell us about your businesses, about your journey. You've got, a, you've got a long journey even that goes back before your businesses. So tell us about those. Um, I moved around uh, the States and then found Milwaukee, fell in love with Milwaukee, and then this has become home ever since. I went to college here and then I started my professional career here as well. And um, yeah, now we have two businesses. We have the farmhouse was our first baby, the farmhouse paint and sip. And then during the pandemic, we came up with another business just trying to complement the current business that we had because it was struggling we needed food traffic and we were struggling with that and we said well what is a business that we can do that um, doesn't depend on people actually coming into the building and that's how we came up with Chuchas Red Tacos and it's a food truck that is actually outside of the farmhouse paint and sit. <laughs> That's awesome. What um, there's there's a lot behind both those journeys to get to the farmhouse and to get to Chucho. So are you willing to share with us about what your journey into becoming an entrepreneur? Because you weren't you weren't born an entrepreneur. None of us are actually born an entrepreneur, um, but but we work our way into it. So take us on your journey, please. So it's interesting because I believe my journey started really young. Um, and my dad is an entrepreneur. He's always been an entrepreneur. So I don't know. I've like just seen him. Well, my mom uh, was a professional uh, person, you know, working in, in the corporate environment. And my dad had his, his own business. And I remember as a eight years old, like trying to make sales or whatever I made, I always try, tried to find something to make money off of. Um, and I found that really fun, okay? But sometimes I would realize that it would take me too long to make a product mm -hmm. and I wouldn't get enough money for it. So I would be like, okay, that's not working. <laughs> so I will keep trying. And I, um, yeah, I had different uh, stages of it and a couple of them were very successful. Um, however, uh, this, there's a story that uh, I recently realized about this story, but one of my most successful businesses, it was when I was like 13 or 14 years old, it was selling donuts. Uh, so back home, you could get from the people who make it um, trade and uh, you could go door by door and sell them. And bottom line is sales were so good that I will have like five trays and I was able to get a spot in the grocery store. And I was selling out all like the weekends. It was great. But during that time, I had just changed schools and I started like a new school. And uh, one of the parents came with one of my classmates and they felt sorry for me because I was working. Um, and I remember feeling so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. And because I really didn't need to work. My dad always was like, why are you doing this? But I just loved the the hustle, I guess. <laughs> and um, so I quit. I, I just won. I came back home that night and I, I still had product and I just never went back. And my dad was so upset with me. Um, so instead, uh, a few like two years later, then I got a, my first job <clears throat> at a clothing store. Um, so I feel like it was in me to kind of, you know, like run a business. But again, I let the influence of other people or what they thought of me kind of affect that, although I was doing really well. And uh, and I guess I didn't realize that lesson until now, like that I'm older because I was too young uh, to really, and I didn't speak to anybody about this. I think if I would have told my dad, my dad would have been like, uh, it's okay, <laughs> keep doing your thing, you're doing great. 
Um, so yeah, I got a job that was, you know, far more acceptable, right? And I stayed with them until I moved here. So it was about three, four years. And, but I got to do sales, which is what I used to love at the time. And the owner, she really taught me a lot of things. Little by little, I learned about inventory, um, even during reconciliations, making sure that what we had on the books was exactly what we had. So she, I learned a lot from her. And, um, but then, yeah, then I moved here. Uh, my mother had moved here, so I came to visit and then I chose to stay. And, uh, but my mom had different expectations. She wanted me to get a degree, get a corporate job. And, um, you know, at that time I was just through going through so much, trying to adjust to the new culture, trying to learn the language, um, you know, also trying to meet my mother's expectations, which I'm thankful for. Right. Uh, but I just follow them that path. I first got a, um, degree in marketing, a technical degree or associates. And then I continue with an accounting degree. Um, I fell in love with school though. So I'm very thankful to her for that because now I love learning. And ever since I graduated, I've been missing school, but I continue to educate myself even as a business owner. Um, so yeah, that's in a nutshell how all happened. Obviously, um, when I got here, I had to start again from the bottom. So I was working in sales, like selling perfumes. Uh, then from there, I went into the banking industry. And once I had my accounting degree, that's when I was able to move into more of the corporate finance uh, jobs. Wow. Can I, uh, I just want to accentuate a couple of things that you shared there. One, a lot of entrepreneurs, you, you feel alone. Like sometimes the advice you get from family members and friends it, uh, and you even sort of, you referenced it sort of accidentally the way you said it, like, you know, my mom was a professional and there's sort of this feeling sometimes around entrepreneurs that it's like, why don't you get a real job? Like raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur, you ever heard someone say, why don't you get a real job? And it was like, why don't you try and like do it, like see how this one works. It's a little harder than a real job. It um, is right? totally. Yes. So, so you have I want to keep yourself employed and everybody else employed. <laughs> you know, you have to keep yourself having a job. So it's a lot of responsibility. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And I, so, and I think the other part of that, that's a little bit of why I started Entrepreneur Encounters. I want entrepreneurs to be able to get together, meet other people and find folks who are going to help you support you, who are ready to give, who are ready to give and ready to receive and ready to get some of that information and, and be vulnerable and transparent because it's so necessary. And I think so many of us are in that, in that space. Um, so you got your accounting degree, you were moving on the official corporate life. What, what happened then? So I created my plan. So I'm big into planning. I still do that in my business, but I was doing it at that time for my career. And I was already getting to my five-year plan and achieving all the goals that I had. I, my goal was to become an accountant and then eventually a financial planner. I'm sorry, a financial anal uh, analyst. And but what happened during that time is that I realized that the more I moved up the ladder, the less time I had for me, like the more I belonged to the job I was doing. So, yes, the pay was great. The benefits were amazing. Um, you know, everything was exceeding my expectations. It, I could see that my career path, I had, you know, mentors um, that were also guiding me through the whole corporate life, right? But uh, yeah, then I realized that I really didn't have time for myself. My vacations, I was forced to take vacation because I would lose it, right? And my worry was like, well, if I go on vacation, I'm going to have all this work when I come back. And it was just something that it just didn't make sense. My days were longer. If my family came, I was very limited spending time with them. Um, so I, I started to really, I, I even questioned, can I have a family? Because one of the things for me to have children was I want to be involved to, in my children's life. If I, you know, if they have something in school or even the first years, I want to be there with them. Um, maybe not full time, but be, have the flexibility, right. To spend time with them. And I was, that seemed like that was not possible. So that's when I started questioning it. I was like, did I do the right thing? Because I really think 
you know, I went from working eight hours a day to now working 12 to 14 hours a day. And the job doesn't seem to, you know, like sometimes you have projects, right? And you know, you're going to have put in a lot of time, but this was just what the job was. So that's when I started questioning it. And um, yeah, and around that time, my husband then started asking me, so I marry an entrepreneur and, uh, I, you know, I, I, he had a, my husband had a design and printing business at the time. And he just, when we bought this property, so everything happened just at the right time, I think. So we were looking for a home, but we just didn't want a home. We wanted to make sure that um, we could get some income from it. So we were looking for a duplex or for a unit. Uh, and we just came across this property that had, had it all. It was far close, it needed a lot of work, but it had it all. It had a house, it had commercial buildings, it had a lot of land. So we were like, okay, this is it. Uh, so then after we moved into the house, which it was quite a project, he asked me, he's like, why don't we get into business together? I don't see you anymore. You know, like he just started um, just kind of, you know, proposing this. And I said, well, you know, like I will support you in the project. Yes, let's do it, but I cannot leave my job. So I think the universe, when you really want something, works to help you towards that if you really want it. Because what's funny is that as I'm starting to question myself, this opportunity of my husband wanting to do business with me, um, I they actually closed the, the center where I was working and they moved that business center to Europe. Um, and the, here's the other thing, there were different waves like three different waves. And I was on the last one, which it bought me time, right? To like, kind of just get everything ready for me. And not only that, but they, when, you know, you lose your job like that, they also give you like a bonus because, you know, they're pretty much letting you go. Um, so that's when I took a step back and I was like, oh my gosh, is, you know, the universe trying to tell me something? <laughs> and I said, okay, let me really look at my options and what I can do. Like, should I then, continue this path or should I try something new and see what happens and when I asked that question I realized that an accountant always will have a job meaning like if let's say for example I can couldn't get back into the career the the um, corporate career I could always then start my own bookkeeping or tax accounting or whatever uh, so I was like okay this is low risk so I assessed the risk of like okay what would this look like if I do make the move? So I said, okay, I don't want to just guess. So I'm just going to join my husband in business and we'll see what happens. And it worked out perfectly. I had literally like 10 months of the transition. I make sure that the new person could do my job in Europe. Um, and then I told them like, hey, I really, well, this is a funny part. At the end, they asked me to stay as support because obviously, you know, the, the business was now in Europe. They still wanted me to like be a resource for them. But I had to say, no, I right now really need to focus on my new business. And um, thank you so much for, you know, for, for everything. Because it still was a great company. I, I, I definitely don't have hard feelings. As a business owner, I know that sometimes you have to make tough decisions. So I completely understood why they did what they did. Yeah. But yeah, so it was a combination of what was going on in my life and internally. And then this just happened. So it was like the perfect storm to just make this switch. Yeah, let me, let me, I just want to, um, <laughs> well, I want to highlight something that I've heard in a lot of entrepreneur stories. I mean, part, part of why I'm collecting these stories, I'm like, I got to record these stories that people have amazing stories. Um, if you don't believe that there's a God, that there's a higher power, there's a divine being, just go talk to entrepreneurs and you'll see these like, <laughs> These coincidences seem to weave in and out and there's an opportunity or one chance or a certain sponsor will come along or an ally and just help people out in a way that's like, wow, if not for that one thing, I might be spinning off in a different direction. So, um, you know, I have a story like that. Others have a story like that. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, yes. so you're, so you're T minus whenever, like your severance is going to run out. You've decided you're going to invest in this. And this is the farmhouse we're talking about now. So you've got yes. the property. Uh, your husband says, hey, let's figure out how to get in business together. And then what? Um, so 
okay, we got the severance, we did have uh, savings, and then we say, okay, let's get the farmhouse. Uh, so here's the thing, the property was foreclosed and abandoned. So every each one of the buildings needed work. So we were already in the house, and we needed to fix the farmhouse. And <clears throat> for that, we started going to banks, and we asked banks for so I had draft a business plan because obviously we came up with the idea or my husband came up with the idea. He's the idea guy. I'm the person who takes the idea. And then I do the market research. I make sure that I look up, uh, you know, what the cost is going to be for the product and how much profitability will be for each one of them. Or I shouldn't say profitability, but the profit margin. Um, and can I, can from I there, you? can I pause yes. you there for a second? Yes. What's it like? That sounds like an amazing partnership, someone who's a visionary and someone who's able to execute the plan. How, how has that been? Has that been an asset and a, and a great benefit to your to your relationship and your businesses? Yes. At first, we used to clash a little bit because it was like two powers coming together, right? Like he has a strong feeling about what he's seen and I had a strong feeling about what I was seeing with the numbers. But um, again, through education, I learned that we needed to take a test uh, on our strengths and weaknesses, which we kind of knew, but taking the test really helped us big time because then what we decided, we agreed, both of us did, was to focus on each other's strengths and really respect it and rely on those. So obviously this came up on this test, this personality test, and then we said, okay, we got it. So we really got to like make sure that um, we're not clashing, that we actually collaborating. And uh, yeah, we, we tackled that pretty soon. We didn't let it, because again, we are also married. <laughs> we, when we went into business, we made sure that the business, or we promised each other that the business was not gonna impact our relationship. So we always have to find the best way to solve a problem. We cannot, you know, like be mad or anything like that <laughs> to each other because of the business. So right now it's great because anytime, it, it's not that I cannot come up with ideas, but it's more difficult for me. Or he really is really easy for him to come up with ideas and, and connect different things that other people cannot really see how they connect. So he does have that ability. So when he has these ideas, now he comes to me and he's like, can you look into this? What do you think? And then we talk about the financial part. And trust me, there's been many projects where when we get to that stage of doing the numbers, uh, he then sees it and he's like, okay, forget it. Like, let's not waste time on that. That's not going to work. <laughs> but the same is true for the things that has worked. Then when we look at, you know, something that will work or could work, then we're like, oh, let's go all in this project. And that's part in part how the, the chuchos then happened. Um, but yeah, it's great. It, I feel like we know that this is uh, um, something that, like we could, you know, we, we need each other because it's definitely, we complement each other and it makes it a lot easier. And also with our staff, like, you know, like our staff gets to see it as well. And they know who to come with, with certain things because we have, you know, different approaches and views and everything, but yet we have one main common goal and culture, if you will. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's Well, I mean, that's, it's amazing that you recognize that there's a, there's a value in that. And then you had to figure out how to overcome that conflict, how to, how to navigate that with the added difficulty. Um, and it's difficult to, because it's family, in this case, it's a, it's a marriage relationship. So, um, but that's, that, I think that's a wonderful story because uh, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs, again, it's a, they feel like it's a solo journey. Um, and I know a lot of funders won't, won't fund businesses, interestingly, that don't have a partner involved. Uh, prop maybe because you need a couple of those pieces to go together. So speaking about funding, you started. Oh, go ahead. You wanted to talk. Well, about I was going to say, too. you know, I was I went to this uh, business conference. So at least once a year, I try to go to some sort of like intense training for business owners. And the first one I went um, talked about that. How like you are the one person in your business, but you need. So there's three people in the business, and one of that is the person that comes up with the idea. Then there's the person who manages the idea and the everyday 
things in a business. And then there is the entrepreneur or the person that thinks about like, how are we going to make money? How is this business profitable? Can we sell this business? Not that you're going to sell it, right? But just asking those questions, like how we make this business worth um, um, something, right? It could be anything that you want to. And I feel like sometimes, yes, you need those people. I mean, no, sometimes you definitely need it. In our case, he's a visionary. I'm the person who manages like everything that's moving. And when it comes to entrepreneurship, we both have it, but we leverage mastermind groups. We leverage business conferences. We leverage other resources of other people that are ahead of us so that we can get that knowledge because we cannot get it ourselves. So yes, that's a big thing that has made a difference in our journey is recognizing who we are in the business and who we need in the business and not thinking that we can do it all. I did have that faulty thinking when we started, thinking like nobody could do it the way I could. And that, you know, I was the only person. And I did learn from this conference and my husband how to switch that. And it has been a game changer now that I realize, like, no, 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 I'm not the only person. And what I do know, I have to somehow teach other people to be able to do it. And um, yeah, that's helped us really like get to the next level in our business for sure. That's so tough. yeah. <laughs> no, well, those are those are super good pieces. And even if you don't have a business partner, there are still lots of resources you can seek out. There are lots of opportunities to be connected. You can meet other amazing entrepreneurs like Time A. Yes. You can find a coach. You can do a lot of things to help you continue broadening your scope of, of knowledge. You were going to talk to us about banks. I'd love to know how many banks did you actually have to go to? And then tell me about the process True. of funding it. Because a, a foreclosed property, usually they're not in the hottest shape um, when you get them. So they need a lot of work. And particularly because you're going to turn it into a commercial venture. You've got a little bit of work. So t- walk us through all that. Well, it was a little. So there's different phases, right? When we initially bought the property. So again, we were looking for residents, uh, resi- you know, like a uh, like a duplex and usually that's considered residential or even a four du- a four unit could be considered a residential uh, type of loan. When we find this property because of the zoning and everything that we have here, um, it was a different kind of deal. But here's the thing, we had been working with the bank, it's a national, uh, a local bank, um, for a little bit, like we were coming with different uh, other properties. It's just that something always happened with the other properties and it just didn't work uh, with the person who was vending or selling the property. So when we find find this, they actually took the time to come here and they saw the property and I was like, oh my God, these people are not going to approve us because the property was just like the house, you could not live in there. Like it was missing walls. It was was just in really bad shape. Um, So, but that's even before we consider the business. The idea when we first saw the property was like, okay, we live in the house and we're gonna rent the commercial building, which is like 3000 square feet. So it's a big building. So that was originally what we were gonna do. And uh, for that lending, we did have the down payment, um, but we did have to go to family members because here's the thing, for commercial property, you need 20% down of the price of the, you know, the, what you're purchasing. And obviously we were not looking for commercial and we were like, oh shoot, we're a little short <laughs> for the down payment. Um, so then we reach out to family members, we borrow uh, uh, for the down payment. And once we had the down payment, they gave us, we had great credit um, and, you know, pros, my W2, my husband business was doing okay at the time as well. So then, yeah, we got the loan for the property. So then we, um, with the rest of the savings that we had, we worked on getting the house ready to go. And yeah, that, that took us about nine months. Um, so that's when all the thing, when we started questioning, should we do the business, our business, instead of renting the commercial building, because we were not getting good um, tenants or uh, not that we were not getting good tenants, but the leads were not ideal. And we have a greenhouse next door. It's just the business. It just didn't, you know, it was like our house. It was just not a good match. And we said, okay, let's do our business. So for that one, we went to two different banks and they didn't even call us back. 
So we were like, okay, how can we bootstrap at this point, you know? Um, but thank goodness, there is a local organization here called WIBIC, Wisconsin Women Business Initiative Corporation, and they work with non-traditional loans and, you know, with smaller projects as well. And we submitted our business plan and they loved it. They, I, it was like a Shark Tank kind of thing. Like they will look at the business plan. Um, then if they liked it, they will call you in for this interview with the, all the different people that fund that, that, because it's different banks that fund the, the, the note, I will say. So yeah, then I went for that. They interviewed me. Uh, I was so nervous, but it went great. And then, yeah, they gave us the that money to improve the, the farmhouse, to all do all the stuff and get started, the equipment, the inventory, all of it. Um, and then, yeah, so we opened doors. And within a year, the next thing we did, just to make it all easier on us, we... Um, refinance everything so the business and the house and we paid off webic and then madc milwaukee economic development corp corp i think it is yeah um they came in then and they're also similar to webic just a little bit bigger i believe um and then we just combine everything they make it into one and now that's who we're working with and yeah, that's pretty much how the journey uh, started when it came to like the financing. The good thing is that, yeah, we haven't, I mean, from then on, we were good in paying our own stuff and paying our loans. So ever since we haven't had to borrow anymore. Thank goodness. So out of curiosity, who'd you work with at Wibbick? Like what? Um... Well, um, initially it was Benny, but right now, um, Lily Alvarado. She is like the Hispanic consultant yeah. for Webex and she is amazing. I mean, she was, yeah, she was the person actually that welcomed me that day that went to, I went to the Shark Tank kind of interview. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And ever since I've been working with her. So that's fantastic. So the, so the build out of farmhouse meant without any hitches, your contractors were excellent. How did that, how did that work for you? We only had one problem with the farmhouse uh, and it was with one of the plumbing people, but you know, once you tell them like, Hey, I'm going to, my lawyer is going to step in. Then all of a sudden, like they do have time, <laughs> but that project with the contractor went well. The one that we had little hiccups and we ended up going to court with was with the contractor for, for our house. So that person um, did leave with, um, yeah, the money, the materials, everything. And, you know, so we had to like restart again. And, you know, I think reflecting back, there were a lot of challenges when we were trying to open the farmhouse and even finish our house. I even had health stuff, like I had knee surgery, you know, like major things happened. And it's crazy how like when it rains, it pours <laughs> and it is so important to remain focused on what you want and staying positive that's when I started getting into meditating reflecting just really to keep myself positive because um yeah just a bunch of stuff just hit you at once just like the pandemic <laughs> yeah so yeah, this, is why, um, this is why mindset, this is why we talk about money, mindset and means and and you're touching on all of them, but why mindset is so important because the, the, the world can hand you some bad deals uh, or just things can feel differently. And sometimes just how we view it, you mentioned you do some meditation. I think that's awesome. Just figuring out how to clear your mind, how to reframe your perspective and frankly, also just decide, decide, choose that you're going to persevere despite yes, all those because uh -huh. they're because we usually can't forecast what they will be exactly just that there will be something there. Um, and right. I would say that's, that's one of the, one of the key learnings for an entrepreneur. If you could take out of this, when you put your business plan together, you don't put in a line item that says totally unexpected stuff that throws me a curveball and I wasn't expecting it because you can't name it, but you better get ready for it because something will show up. Um, yes. and, and you have to be ready and have to be agile and able to move through that. Yes mindset attitude i completely agree because you know i could have felt sorry for the situation we were going through um 
And we really didn't spend time there because we were like, that's not productive. We really need to find a solution and keep moving forward. And I'm not going to say I love being in that mode because it's pretty like high pressure, right? But it's crazy how our major breakthroughs have been during very difficult times. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I can say. Like when you really persevere and you have the right attitude and you just keep going, from my experience, it you do have the next thing right in front of you. You just got to push just a little bit harder and then it will come to you. Yeah. So you've got the farmhouse up and running. A couple yes. of years, couple of years go by. Tell us about how you got into business number two, because uh, you got you were running a paint and sip in the midst of COVID, which which is always an exciting story. So, yes, but I want to share also a little bit of the journey. So the farmhouse journey was amazing, meaning that so we started really trying to drive traffic to the business. Like you know, people didn't know about it. We knew we were going to have to do some education for because the paint and sip model was still kind of something new. Um, so little by little. The first year we started growing and people started learning about us. And the other thing is that we have a unique location. It's like, it looks like a farmhouse. Uh, so people started falling in love with the location. So a couple of things happened with that business. We started with canvas painting and then we expanded to wood sign boards. Then we expanded into hall rental. So people will come and say, I want to rent your whole venue for my wedding, for my baby shower, for, you know, just private events. So we started diversifying our business. We didn't only focus on like, oh no, but the only thing we do is painting or, you know, like canvas painting. Um, we often responded to what the customer wanted and we were always listening to them. So that kept us relevant year after year. Um, so on our second year, I noticed that we had a big, so, and this happens in every business, right? You have your high season and you have your low season. So we discovered that we had a low season that was a little lower than we had expected. So we started asking ourselves, and this is why I always say, track your sales, track your numbers, see performance over time so that you can find where the gaps are and then you can ask the right question. So the question that we asked ourselves was, how can we make our slowest season our highest season? That was like, that was a very simple question yet it was so powerful. So by, I no, this was by the third year that we were able to do it. Then we decided to do art festivals. So it had a little bit of art, but also people got to experience like the whole venue. And that went crazy. It was so crazy, the amount of media that we got, free media. I, I wanna mention that because as a business, you also have to come up with creative ways to have people talk about you so that you don't have to pay for these things. And the media is the best thing because they give you obviously internet and TV and you know a bunch of time um, for free. Um, so yeah, so we did this festivals and um, we drove about 4,500, 35 to 4,500, I can remember the number right now, but it's 35 to 4,500 people during those two festivals. We did Frida Fest. So it was based on Frida. And the second one was Selena, which is a famous uh, singer. And um, yeah, so we had live music, we had art projects, we had installations where people could take pictures. I mean, it was like this big thing and people just loved it. And guess what happened? <laughs> we had that year, our, our lowest season became our highest season and outdid the, the rest of the year, which was like amazing. So here comes the fourth year. We're super excited. We're like, yes, we got this. This is our year. We got nominated and also got awarded the SBA Small Business Persons of the Year. Uh, this is starting 2020. <laughs> and here in March then comes COVID. So we were like, oh no, like this 2020 was supposed to be our year. You know, like finally, like everything is just... Um, the next level, okay? So um, especially because we had conquered our slowest season and um, yeah, there was build up for the next festivals. So, okay, so COVID happened and they shut us down and this was a big deal for us because our venue 
obviously depended on people being here. People came here for the experience, people came for the classes. So the first thing we actually asked uh, was like, okay, because everybody was freaking out. We said, okay, what can we do right now? How can we right now like give back and just keep people like off this edge of worry and you know, like just the craziness that was happening. And we said, okay, we're just gonna take our classes online. So we canceled all of our classes and we took it online. And then we said, <clears throat> but we still have to stay in business. So what will be the portion that is going to, you know, the financial portion attached to that? And we said, well, we can offer kits to go, um, painting kits. And that's how we did it. So in three days, it took us three days to pretty much build a new website because we had to take all the other stuff down and um, have the new offerings in the website and the new schedules. I mean, we had just to do redo everything so that it could be online, um, set up for online. And that's exactly what we did. So it took us three days. We had to let go. So we were a team at that time of 13, 14 people. We just kept five of us. Um, and I wanted to add, at the end of 2019, we were like, okay, everything is great. Our business is thriving let's start working on having a family and of course by March I was already pregnant <laughs> so we were not obviously we we're not planning on this so everything was accumulating and we were like okay um you know we're, we're gonna raise a family now we have to uh make, make sure that our business is going to make it the good thing is that I always worked hard for the reserves and my husband always questioned me about the reserves. He always said, why do we just have that money sitting there? <laughs> I'm like, honey, this is for when the skinny cows come. And I don't know if you guys know that story, but in the Bible, uh, they talk about the fat cows and the skinny cows. And um, so that's what I was telling him. This is for the skinny cows. Uh, and sure enough, when COVID hit, we looked at our finances and we were like, okay, we're good for six months. Like we can, if we don't sell one product, we will survive for the next six months and be able to pay our five key people. So we let go of anybody that was part-time um, or that lived with their parents. And we kept our full-timers that we knew that they lived off of this work, job. So, and I was super worried about them. And actually that was the first time we didn't take a paycheck. We said, you know what, we don't need to get paid. And uh, we just need to make sure our staff is getting paid. So that's another thing from the beginning, from the moment we opened our business, we make sure that we were on payroll because we understood how important that was. Um, but okay, so going back to um, COVID. So yeah, so we started doing online classes. It went great. It was so well received. We did events for Mother's Day, we had the most successful Easter event. So we did a drive-through. People could come get the basket and we had the Easter bunny outside handing the baskets and, you know. So we were trying to really like understand the pain everybody was going through and experiencing. And we were thinking, how can we be the, per you know, that business that rides up someone's day or uh, weekend or, you know, even week. <laughs> uh, so we did classes every day. We also started selling our mosaics and everything was going great. But then here comes June, or I think it was July, where they finally open up like 20% or 25%. And it was starting to get warmer outside. And we started seeing the decline. So what happened was people no longer wanted to be on their computers, they wanted to be outside. And obviously they couldn't come to public places. So then we started to worry because that was the time when we usually would do our festivals or well, we had planned to do our second festival. And that's when I think we were back to the drawing board <laughs> and we were like, how are we going to make sure that again, our slowest season in our business doesn't really take us down. Um, and yeah, we just started like throwing ideas. My husband, for years, he's been wanting to do a food business. We kind of tried it at the farmhouse, inside of the farmhouse, it didn't work. So I had a little, you know, bitter taste, but this time he's like, let's do a food truck. It's gonna be outside. And that's how it's gonna work. People are gonna just come get their food and go, or they can order online. 
And I was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Then I said, okay, well, the risk, what is the risk? And it was, it was very minimal. We're like, well, if we build the truck and let's say it doesn't work, worst case scenario, we sell the truck with the equipment and we get the investment back. Um, so once we did, the, again, the numbers and make sure that this could work, that's when we said, okay, let's get the truck and let's start the whole process. And he focused on like, what is the one thing that we can bring to Milwaukee that is not in Milwaukee? And I think that's another thing that made the difference for us, that we focus on something completely different that could appeal to people. And this is what we did. We did red tacos, which comes from birria, which is, um, um, it's like a seasoning that uh, is very specific to a region in Mexico, but I guess everybody can do it however they want it. But the thing is, it was not here in Milwaukee. And uh, yeah, we just put it together and we, so here's the crazy part. Two weeks before we opened, we started doing promo and it went viral. So this thing went crazy. Um, before I jump to that, you know, I was hesitant and I did go to my coach and ran this idea. And I said, what do you think? I'm not passionate about the food business. And she's like, you don't need to be, if your husband is, then go for it. <laughs> she's like, you're the numbers girl, remember? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's right. So that's exactly uh, how we decided to like, there was the last thing or um, validation that we needed. Um, but yeah, so the business goes viral. And, and here's the other thing that I want to share with people is that sometimes having too much traffic also can be a problem. So unlike the farmhouse that we had to slowly bring people with Chucho's, it was just too much. Like we had lines of four hours, three, four hours. And, you know, our staff like was really tired and we were run, running out of products. So this was at the very beginning. The good thing is within a month, we were able to fix it all. I mean, the first thing we did that month or as we were having problems was taking note. This is the problem, this is the problem. How can we fix it? Every day we were asking these questions. And uh, I mean, now it's, it's an amazing, amazing um, business. People love it. It, it. it definitely like took us to the next level. And yeah, we're really excited. We're really excited about this business. You know, I remember I, I drove by on that opening weekend and I thought, oh, I'm going to say hi to Time Oh, my, what? Like, it's just, it, it was, it was amazing. Uh, the line, and you have to remember too, not only was the line long, but we were all theoretically six feet apart. And so the line was super long because um, everyone was backed up. But congratulations on that. And I think it, it shows, um, you know, you had a willingness. One thing I've, I've heard said, and I, and I tell a lot of entrepreneurs this again, you need to have the right product at the right time with the right people in the right market. And it sounds like, interestingly, you tried a concept and it was in, and this time the difference was indoors versus outdoors. And the time was right because people, you know, restaurants were hard to go to 25% capacity. A lot of them didn't open. A lot of them are just opening right now. We're in, uh, some of you may not know this, we're, we're just before Memorial Day on 2021 when we're recording this. Well, restaurants, many of them closed. Many of them uh, yeah. can only do carry out. And here you're providing an opportunity with a base of clientels uh, who, who know you and understand you from these festivals and from the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I say it was the right time and, and in the right place to the right market, even in the midst of the pandemic, those opportunities come up. And that was, that was amazing that you had the courage uh, to trust, but you reached out, you validated, you, you, you questioned with some other people, drew mm -hmm. on that support that you had and yeah, were able to dive for sure. in. Yeah, I think that was big, you know, to always have someone to that you respect, right? And that it's a few steps ahead to ask these questions and really bounce ideas. Because sometimes the answer is just as simple as like, well, how risky is it? And, you know, like, what is at stake? And what's the worst and the best that can happen? And I feel those questions really put it in perspective and get you to think cre in a creative way on how you can do certain things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're really thankful that um, 
yeah, that everything aligned for us to come up with this idea because, I mean, we still have the 25% for the farmhouse. <laughs> so the farmhouse is still impacted. It's been over a year. Um, the good thing is the business is still running. So we, we figured it out and we created a format, uh, a hybrid of in-person and online that still makes that business profitable. But we're still capped, you know, like we still cannot do more than we like we have a capacity but we cannot maximize it because we're limited so chuchos has really came in and uh, provided that stability not only that but we now are a team of 32 people and i would say about 27 of them if not yeah if not more no i think it's about 27 of them of them are full timers so we really don't have part-timers anymore and I think that's a pretty amazing thing to be a business that is actually hiring and we're still looking for more people because <laughs> there's a line, there's another portion of our business now that's becoming popular and that is catering. And we do have another truck now for that, but you know, now we need the people. So uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's been fantastic. We're really, um, we feel blessed for sure. And honored to be able to be, one of the few businesses, well, there's more, a few, but you know, of the businesses that right now are actually providing for people that are without jobs. Wow. Thanks, Taime. Uh, real quickly, if you can touch on, you you mentioned you grew it slowly over four years. Give us like a couple of pointers on how did you, how did you grow your following? How did you grow your awareness? Because I, I know that's a spot a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. They have a pretty great concept. They're excellent at delivering how do people find out about what we're doing? And, and you've obviously been able to build that up. Tell us just a little bit of some things that you've done. So I think for everything, there are systems. Um, and it, it, marketing is not any different. Um, so we have system for our accounting, our, you know, our marketing, um, yeah, operations. So for our marketing, our main thing was, but again, it comes from our numbers. We knew how much our net has to be to capture people and to be able to drive the people that we need in our business. So I think it's very important to know what your goal is mainly. That's the main thing, either sales goal or um, people goal, right? And from that, yeah, we then noticed that, okay, we need to show up daily on our social media and we need to do that in where our people are hanging out the most. So understanding where they spend the most time. So for us, mostly it is Facebook and then Instagram. But now we're finding out that some of our people for Chuchos are also in TikTok. Um, so then, yeah, just finding ways of like, okay, how can we communicate what we do, make engaging, me, en en engaging content. Uh, one thing our followers for Farmhouse really used to love or still love it's memes, you know? So although we were paint and sip, we knew that that was something that lit up their days. So then we will post stuff like that and then they will share it or they will like it or they will tag someone because ultimately that's what you want. You just don't want a like, you want people to interact and let other people know about your content. And that's how other people find out about you. Um, so that was one thing. So really like having a strategy and a plan and a system to show up daily on social media. Then we also focus on capturing uh, people and creating a community. So we have a newsletter. They're part of that. They get special deals. And also, I mean, they find out through our social media, but they're VIPs if they're part of our, our newsletter. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of like how we were able to do that. And that's something that we're always educating ourselves as well, because everything changes really fast. And there's also a lot of tools out there that can help you become more efficient. Um, and that's pretty much what we do. And then, yeah, just finding within the team, because initially we did it all, but then within the team, we're by learning the strengths of our staff we identify the people that are really good at it and are naturals and um, they come up also with ideas on how we can show up better, awesome. but it's an ongoing thing. <laughs> never, it never ends and it never gets the same, but you know what? That's entrepreneurship. You, you've mentioned in your journey, you got to be ready to pivot. You got to be ready to change. You don't know what's going to come up, but it yes. will happen. Time, thank you so much for the time that we had today. 
Again, we are, uh, we're blessed and honored to be able to have Taime with us, Taime Nanez. Chucho's Red Taco is also the farmhouse. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear her doing some more uh, with her awesome husband, Jesus. So uh, this has been an amazing time. Again, I'm Brent Heffwasson. I'm an entrepreneur coach. Thank you for joining us on Entrepreneur Encounters. We strive to be able to bring you the stories of other entrepreneurs. We want you to connect. We want you to know what's going on. We do have some sponsors. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring them up and tell you about them. Andrew Feller Photography has done all our photos. Buckethead Creative uh, helped us with all of our graphic arts. Charlie's Music Factory is going to do our music. We're going to ask Chris to take us out here in the end. And Milwaukee Web Designs uh, handles all our website. In addition to doing these interviews, which you can catch on your social media channel, you're watching us on right now or on YouTube, Wednesdays at 4.30 p.m. Central, we host an opportunity for entrepreneurs to come together and share authentically and to build into one another. This is not a solo journey. We, we refer to solopreneurs all the time, but it's not a solo journey, as you heard Time may say. So if you're looking for a spot where you can build into people and other people can build into you, it's a, it's a free opportunity to come together, get to know each other. Do check out that link, bit.ly slash entrepreneur encounters. I would love to have you. I'd love to see you there. And we look forward to it. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. And let's see if we can figure out how to get Chris to take us out here. Mm -hmm.